All right. Good afternoon. This is Dr. April Murdoch with Becoming a Financially Confident Woman podcast. I am so glad you all are here today. And I figured I would take this podcast episode, uh, take the time to tell you kind of my why behind this podcast, um, my why behind what I do or why I do what I do. Um, and it's my story. But I'm also going to give you some suggestions, some tips that you can apply to your financial life that will, I hope, help you to move in the direction that you want to move in to achieve your financial objectives and your goals. So uh, the reason for the Becoming a Financially Confident Woman podcast, the reason for me starting my firm, Woman to Woman Financial uh, it's quite simple. Uh, women just don't seem to get the financial education that they need. And statistics over and over that I find um, reveal that women are less financially confident. Uh, they are behind men when it comes to saving and investing. And even though they now feel more confident when it comes to handle handling the personal finances in the home, uh, managing those bank accounts. When it comes to long-term planning for themselves, women still lag behind men uh, by a huge percentage. But not only that, my why is because my situation was that was like that. And a lot of my situation was circumstantial, meaning there were circumstances that were beyond my control. And then the, the other part of my situation was because I didn't know. Um, I don't feel like I had the education. Um, and then the other part was I didn't have the income. And so when you when you mesh all of that together, for me, it was a financial mess. And so the reason why I do what I do is because I want women uh, who are starting out, women either, you know, millennials all the way up to those in uh, post-retirement to feel financially confident when it comes to handling their money. And that was something that it took me a very long time to do. So my story simply is, um, at first, I, I was married very young. Um, I grew up in a household where if you were in a relationship with a significant other, then you know, marriage was the next step. So you didn't, quote unquote, like they say, fornicate. And so I got married early, um, was the love of my life. No complaints there. Wasn't like I was in an arranged situation or anything like that. Uh, we both agreed to be married. Now, whether or not we were mature enough to deal with that is a whole nother story. But nevertheless, we both got married. I was married at 19 and my husband was 20. And by the age of 22, I'd had um, our first child, a little girl. And by the by that time, about four months later, my husband suddenly died. Uh, he had a brain aneurysm uh, and he was in a coma for six days. And then he eventually passed away. Um, and that really was a financial wake up call for me. Uh, before then, I was in college. I was, you know, taking care of my husband. I was working and and those kinds of things and, and you know, just making it day to day, managing our money, paying our bills, but no real future plan, no real things in, in place. For instance, we didn't have life insurance in place, uh, definitely not life insurance outside of employment. And when my husband passed away, um, I found out that he didn't have life insurance even with his employment because he hadn't completed the open enrollment paperwork. And that was the that was the catalyst that kind of pushed me into this industry. I became very aware of the need for families to have life insurance, to be able to take care of each other when something happens to one another or either one of you and to be able to leave a legacy for your family. So those you leave behind, your children. And, um, and I, you know, it, the work that I do now, uh, I've heard a lot of people say like, oh, I don't want to leave all this money to my children. I don't want to make them rich. And, you know, 
I understand, you know, some children are not financially responsible uh, and you feel like that may damage them. And there are ways that you can set that up where that will not happen. But even if you don't want to make them rich and, you know, have leave them so much money where they're going out buying cars and just being wasteful with the, the resources, one thing is you, you really need to think about is, well, they have to deal with you, you know, and if something happens to you or not, if when something happens to you, you are going to leave some things behind, whether it's your loved ones, whether it's your home, uh, debt, and the ability to be able to take care of your remains when you pass away. I mean, gone are the days where you could bury somebody in the backyard or, you know, I don't even know if that ever existed. But you can't do that now. And even cremation is not cheap and you still have to pay for it. So if nothing else, making sure that you have that part covered, I think that was the that was the main thing for me at that stage in my life. I was so upset. I was so stressed out. I was trying to figure out how am I going to bury my husband? I had a four month old. I had just gone back to work off of midterm after finishing maternity leave. And my position where I worked, I actually was going back kind of contractual because my husband and I had agreed at the time that after I had our daughter, I would stay at home with her and I would go to classes at night to finish up my degree. So it wasn't like I had a job and I didn't have him on any life insurance either. I didn't have a job that provided me benefits at that time. So when he passed away, the struggle was real. How were we going to find the money to bury him? And um, it's a long story, but that was one of the things that kind of thrust me into realizing and sitting up and taking notice when it came to managing my resources, managing money. And so um, I went on about my life and we overcame that challenge. And of course, I immediately got life insurance. I mean, when I talked to one of my good friends, she told me about Prudential at the time and the Prudential guy was at my house and I made sure that I had life insurance for myself, for my daughter. And then that became the start of my kind of interest in this industry. Um, but my financial mistakes continued. Um, I didn't really know how to manage money. Um, I have grew up in an environment where we robbed Peter to pay Paul and Mary and Sue. And so just shuffled a lot. Um, did have the insurance in place, but really didn't understand personal finance. So I kind of found myself always behind the eight ball, not really understanding how to manage money. Um, it was a big struggle for me. And so about eight years after my husband passed away, I met and I remarried. And um, I think part of my my issues were, you know, when I wanted help, I needed help and I connected and fell in love uh, with someone and we got married because it just made sense. I got pregnant and needed to get married. And I will say my financial challenges did not go away. I don't even care how many incomes you have. You can have two incomes coming in your house, which we did. Um, and we still had financial issues. Um, I wasn't very savvy in managing money. We all, always seem to never have enough money to manage. So that was also an issue. We struggled with having an income problem. And so uh, 10 years after the marriage, I ended up divorced, moving to another state. And two years after the move, I became homeless. And um, that was really a challenge for me. Now, before that happened, I started really doing some uh, research and education. I actually started uh, taking classes or listening to like um, personal finance experts on the radio, uh, reading their books. I even started a book club at the church I was going to just trying to learn how can I manage my money? What does building wealth look like? I knew that there had to be a better way, but I just didn't understand how to start it. 
I would beg my husband for us to take these personal finance classes. And to be honest, the $99 that it cost to take for us to take it, we didn't have it. I mean, we had at the time, we had uh, four children to in the house to feed. Um, one was kind of part-time, he was grown, but the other three really needed all of our attention. They were young. And so, you know, to pull $99 out of our budget to sit in a personal finance class to learn how to manage our money, I just couldn't get the buy-in. And it was, it just didn't seem justifiable for us to do that. And I know that sounds so crazy now, but that was the limiting belief that we had at the time. And so when we divorced, one of the first things that I did was I paid for that class. And I made sure that I went to that class to figure out things as well. But even a little before that, things I started educating myself on was like, okay, hun, we need a budget. What does that look like? And I started downloading and figuring out how to create a budget. And so one of the things that that is my personality is I learn best when I teach. So because I had to do the research and I had to get the information and share it with others, that taught me a lot and that helped me to begin managing our finances better, understanding how to manage it and realizing that, guess what? We don't necessarily have a spending problem. We have a huge income problem. And then now it was about how can we increase our income so that we can at least maintain our basic lifestyle. But we still continue to struggle. And like I said, um, after divorce, I moved here. I had gotten a great job in Jacksonville, Florida, which is where I am now. And um, got a great job, was doing well financially. I remember, you guys, I remember saving money. Um, and one of the first goals was to save money in an emergency fund of $1,000. And every week I would sit down upstairs in the loft and I would do our finances for the week and put money away to get a thousand dollars. And I'll be honest, at that time I was 39 years old and I had not amassed a thousand dollars in an emergency fund ever in my life. And so finally I amassed that amount of money. I never forget it. I had my children on board. I was telling them what we were do, what I was doing, and so making adjustments to our. Even though we, you know, I made enough money to do things, you know, the the first objective as a family was to get that money set aside, and so I did it. I remember sitting at my desktop and seeing the thousand dollars in my account and screaming and crying because I had amassed that amount of money, and I know that sounds really weird. And you're like, oh, my gosh, like, how did it take you so long? But I promise you, without the financial literacy, without the support, it is really hard to do. It is really hard to even envision a life where you can be financially free. And even before, um, you know, I moved into this industry, I had been introduced to network marketing. So I'd seen success. Um, I was very involved in things like the Amway business and Mary Kay. And I was always trying to figure out a side hustle to do so that I can increase the income for my family. So it wasn't like I was sitting around depending on someone. I was hungry. But even if you get money, one of the issues you have, one of the challenges is overcoming some of the mindset issues that you have so to, so that you can properly manage it. And that's why we see a lot of times the lotto winners, they, they win all this money, but because they haven't dealt with basic personal finance, um, basic money management skills and mindset shifts, they wind up losing it. And so that is the challenge. But nevertheless, I finally saved my thousand dollars. I was clicking along. I was feeling good. I had saved a bunch of money. I started doing that routinely. And then almost two years later, I wind up losing my job. And the whole time in the back of my mind was, gosh, I would love to teach people how to do this. I would love to teach people how they too can get free from the financial bondage that I knew like some of my friends were in and some of my church friends and just the community at large. 
I really wanted to help them. And so even while I was working, y'all, on the weekends or in the evenings, I would do workshops. I would book a room in a library and I would do workshops. Like at the beginning of the year, I created this New Year No Debt workshop to teach people how to get rid of debt, uh, teach people how to create a budget. So I was I started becoming very active in educating the community and when I lost my job, I was able to sustain myself for, for about a year. And then I moved, wound up having to move because the person who owned our townhouse, and it was at the height of 2008, they weren't paying the mortgage. And hence, we had to move to a new place. And when we moved to a new place, I had the money to make the move, moved in, and then was without employment And the person that owned the second place that we lived in decided that they were not going to renew my lease and they were going to go ahead and put the place up for sale. So I had to get out. And when we had to move, I was in between jobs. I had no real income. I was literally living on a small amount of money that was coming in every week, some unemployment, and I was doing my best to just find work and you know do the workshops that I was doing and it was just moving very slow and so I ended up homeless that year and actually what I also did was that year before I ended up homeless I had started in the insurance business and worked for a company and did very well but for some reason I wasn't making money it was taking a long time to make enough money that I needed for myself and my fam my girls my and my son and so um I caught me at a bad time and I wound up having to live in a shelter for the summer and restart and start my life all over and we did we did that they came my kids Um, And I got out of the shelter and found a place to live and picked up and started all over again. So my motivation for doing the work that I do for this podcast, for helping women become financially confident and create, you know, and grow generational wealth has a lot to do with my background and my poor financial history. And, you know, no one ever talked to me about money mindset. And, you know, I knew about the law of attraction and I know that you can do things. So, you know, I know that you can have a skill like I can budget down to the penny and I can do these things. But there are other other things that come into play when it comes to managing money. And I really didn't know that. So, you know, today I wanted to give you a synopsis of my why, of why I do what I do. And I actually, you know, to continue the story, I actually um, came out of homelessness. I went back into higher education because I have a background, an extensive background in higher education and said, hey, I'm not going to do the insurance business anymore anymore. Um, I'm just going to focus on my education and growing and moving up in that area and moving into a, maybe a senior leadership position at some point. And I did. I talked with my college president at the time, and she suggested that I get my doctorate. She felt like my um, experience was great. She felt like my work ethic was great. But I needed to have that credential in order to move into a senior level position, as well as have some experience as faculty. So I took her advice. I went to school. I got my doctorate. I worked full time. I raised my children. And then I became a college professor. And because I also, in addition to having a background in higher ed, I have a background in logistics and supply chain management. I came out, I was running a logistics and supply chain management program, um, and then eventually became a faculty member in that program. And although I love teaching on the side, I was, I was enjoying teaching people how to manage money. I always had a love for that. And that continued. And I realized that I liked doing that more than I liked teaching logistics. And even with all the crazy financial things, um, I took the risk and resigned as a full-time professor and started my firm. And 
it was a crazy, scary thing to do. Um, you do need to have some assets and some savings set aside to make those kinds of moves. Um, and then there is a level of faith that you need to have to do that. And I felt like I had all of that and I had the support of my children. I was really concerned about that. Um, at the time, they saw me working with clients part time and how much I loved it. And when I suggested or just made a comment, rather, I didn't suggest it. I made a comment. Hey, you know, I love doing this work. Oh, gosh, I wish I could do more of this. My children, both my girls were like, well, mom, quit. And I was like, oh, gosh, no, I don't want us to end up homeless. By that time, I had bought my own home. You know, I, I was driving my car that I, my dream car that I had on my refrigerator for years and years. And so they said, but if God gave us this, um, he gave us this house, he'll give it to us again. You, you quit, mom, do what you love. And so after prayer and contemplating it and uh, talking with a couple of people that I respected, I decided to resign. And I resigned from my faculty position. And it was challenging. It was hard. It was a hard thing to do to give up security for instability, so they say, right, in, fin in entrepreneurship. But it is the best thing that I've ever done because I love the work that I do. I love seeing women come to me who are very successful, who are smart, who are educated, and then helping them move from the level of I'm not, I don't have the confidence I need to becoming financially confident and putting a plan in place so that they can live the lifestyle they deserve. So that's my backstory. That's my why for why I do the work that I do and why I believe, I say it all the time to my clients, I'm going to die doing this work because I think it's such important work. You know, 80% of women die single, and that's a statistical fact. And so if we as women don't understand how to manage our personal finances, how to create wealth, how to grow wealth, how to develop a financial plan so that when it's time, when we want to maybe dial down the work that we're currently doing to maybe more part-time work, or if we just want to exit our industry altogether and never work again, we need to make sure we have a plan in place to be able to do that. And, you know, we take care of everyone else. I have raised my children. They are all grown. They are all doing well. But we did that. Women do that. But what tends to happen is we put ourselves on the back burner. And so we don't invest enough for retirement. We put our education, our health, everything at risk to take care of others, whether it's taking care of your loved one, your significant other, your parent, your children, and then you think about you. And I'll be honest, I know this may sound selfish. I wish I had done it the other way around. Me first and everybody else next. And I believe that once we get, once we do that, everyone else that we come in contact with will have a great relationship with them. There won't be a sense of being slighted and it just won't be negative. You'll have the peace and the joy and the comfort and the confidence that you need to have as a person operating in this world. So today, I'm not just going to leave you with my story. I'm going to give you some tips, some things that I did and I implemented in my life to be able to, one, get to where I am, two, help the other the women that I get the privilege and honor of helping and serving, and three, maybe help someone else, help my family. So I, my children, uh, I try my best to help them and educate and encourage them and empower them when it comes to handling money and creating wealth because they are the next generation coming and that's very important to me. So what are some things that I did? Because I'm telling y'all, I mean, I came from the, the bottom you know, um, <laughs> to now, and I'm in a way better place. I'm in a much better position financially, emotionally, mentally. My mindset is different, and I'll tell you some of the things that I did. 
So the first thing that I did was I really had to take a look at where I was. You know, a lot of times we don't understand. Oh, my gosh, I, I make this money. It's going. Where is it going? I don't understand. I don't have enough. I don't. And so one of the first things that I had to do and the first things that I suggest my clients do and I actually do it with them is I review their finances and we figure out what does it take for them to maintain their lifestyle. And there are two things that we look at. We look at what does it take for them to maintain their basic lifestyle. So I had to look at that. Like bare minimum for everything to keep running, my house payment or my rent, my car payment, my car insurance, uh, groceries, electricity, gas, uh, you know, all the things that it takes for me to maintain my basic life. I'm not talking about things like entertainment and eating out. And I, I'm not even talking about getting your nails done and your hair did. I'm talking about just the things that you need for your house to operate, for you to be able to say, you know, every month I can pay those bills. And then I take it a step further and I said, what does it take for me to do the things that I like to do in addition to my basic lifestyle? So I remember when I was in the state of struggle um, and, and especially when I was being married, a pedicure was a big thing for me. Like getting my nails done in a pedicure, I was like, oh my gosh, I, I, would, I did a side hustle for a while. I sold Mary Kay for a while and I never forget my, my director, she always had her nails done. She always had her toes done. It just always looked good. And I just felt like, oh man, God, it would be so nice to be able to routinely get my, my pedicures and my manicures, like at least once a month. And that was a goal of mine. That was a prayer of mine. I would say that all the time. So when, when we look at what did it take, when I looked at what did it take for me to manage my life on a basic level, then what did it take for me to manage my life on that level? So adding in, okay, getting my hair done, getting my tools done, you know, and my nails done, you know, every month. With, or having pizza night with my kids. That was another big thing. Like on Friday night, uh, we keep the Sabbath in our house. And when we, when I was married, we would make our own pizza. We would bring the pizza and we would, you know, add the toppings. And I was like, oh my gosh, it would be so amazing where on Fridays I could just order the pizza and it's delivered to my house and I don't have to do that. So those were things I added to my desired budget. So I had a basic review and then I had okay this is the desired amount of money I would need and I think we need to really be honest with ourselves a lot of people have no clue what it takes to run their house um, and they have no clue what it takes to run their desired life or they think they do and then we when we really peel back the curtain and I had to do that myself I realized that I was so out of touch with what it took for me to live my basic and my desired life. The other thing is, what is your income? You know, I've worked with a lot of professional women, uh, professional women executives and women medical professionals, physicians, healthcare executives. And, you know, it's interesting. I'll ask one of my, a, a woman physician client, like, well, how much do you make? And they don't have a clue. They'll say, I, I don't know. I think 200 250 you should know how much you make to the penny now I know that you know in certain industries there's some overtime and double time and a half and you may get paid different incentives but your base salary you need to know that number you need to be very clear on how much you make and if that means you have a con pulling your contract out making sure your contract and the pay stub, if your W-2 employee matches, you need to understand that. And I cannot tell you the number of women who have no clue as to what their income is. Their annual income, their monthly income, completely clueless. Please make sure you do that. I had to do that. That is the one of the most important steps. Then the next thing I had to do was develop a spending plan. You know, everyone says that a budget, a spending plan is so restrictive. In fact, 
it has such a negative connotation. You know, when you and your girlfriends are going to go out or something and girl, I'm on a budget. It's like, what? So that means what? It means, oh, a budget means I can't spend any money. And that is so wrong. A budget means that you can spend money. It just means that you you got to be clear and you have to be aware of how much money you're spending for that activity. See, no one really wants to be held accountable to that. It's like, I, I just want to go out with my girls and I just want to have bottom, most bottomless mimosas and, and do and brunching and all that. But at the end of the day, you really kind of not need to know how much money you should allocate for that. You know, I tell people all the time, corporations know how much they spend for each line item. So if they're going to buy supplies, they know how much money they allocate for supplies. They know how much money they're going to allocate for salaries. They know how much money they're going to allocate for benefits. So you need to know how much money you're going to allocate for your activities. So because you need to understand that, some people feel like that's restricting. No, it's freeing. The question really is, can you afford the activity that you want to do? Is it something that you should be doing? And is it consistent with your goals? Now, look, I'm not a Debbie Downer. I'm not saying you shouldn't do things and you shouldn't have fun. And I'm a brunch girl and I love hanging out and doing all those things. But you have to allocate the amount of money you're going to spend on that. So if you're going to do the brunch thing every week, then and if it's 30 bucks a week, then you just need to make sure that you have 120 to 150 dollars aside for the brunching. What's wrong with that? You're free in that regard. You know how much you're going to spend. And honestly, you have to be true to yourself. You have to be honest with yourself and you have to take care of you. You know, one of the things with the spending plan, I say to ladies all the time, the best form of self-care is creating a spending plan and a budget. You are taking care of yourself because you are in charge of your money. No one else is in charge of the money. You are the one who gets to say, I'm going to brunch this week. I'm getting my nails done this week. I'm going to go to vacation. I'm going to go on vacation Whatever it is, you can design that life, but you just have to allocate the money to those different activities and things that you want to do. Like, for instance, I kayak once a month. That's my love. I love kayaking. And at minimum, I'll kayak once a month with a group where we've got to rent a kayak. So I'll allocate like 50 bucks to that once a month and I'll bring my lunch. I research how much it costs. I know maybe to rent a kayak, maybe, you know, 15 to $40. And after we finish, I have money for eating out. And I literally bring the money with me. Okay, after we do this, I know I'm going to spend maybe $25 in eating lunch. And I've allocated that money to that activity. So I'm free. I'm not in bondage. I'm not stressed out. I'm free. I know I can kayak. I know I can eat out after I kayak. I know I've got gas money allocated for the activity. I'm good to go. So developing a plan, a spending plan, a budget for the things you want to do is very, very important. The next thing is paying yourself first. You know, I cannot tell you the number of people who don't do this. And there are two ways that you can pay yourself first. One way is if you are a W-2 employee, you should be investing in your company's retirement plan. If they have one, you need to be in it. And, you know, you may not be able to contribute up to the max, right? But the goal would be to do that. So contribute just the amount of money so that they would match it. So if they give, if you give 6% and they match 6%, then the goal would be to get up to that 6% contribution so that you can get that free money from your employer. The other thing is if you're self-employed, the same thing applies. Like you are the employee and you are the employer. So you as the employee, if you're paying yourself through payroll, you contribute. And then the company, which is your company, also matches, can match that contribution if it's established right. 
and it comes from the business. So you too can get the benefit of putting money away for yourself and paying yourself. So that's one way is investing. And then the other way is making sure you have an emergency fund, literally saving, putting the money aside uh, every pay to make sure that if something happens in life, the car breaks down, the refrigerator dies, the AC unit goes out, the water heater goes out, um, you know, an accident happens and you got to pay a deductible. You have that money set aside. And ideally, you know, it's 10 to 15 percent of your income. So that those would be the goals. But whatever the case may be, listen, if you're not in a position to go that high, starting with something is better than nothing. So I remember like 50 bucks was always the, the amount, you know, all I can afford to put away is 50 bucks a month. Hey, put it away. Do it. Be consistent because like a muscle, you're going to train your mind and your habits to continue to contribute to that 401k or that, that business retirement plan and contribute to your savings account. And you're going to be building that muscle. But not only that, you're going to be building money for your future as well as for what could happen in the future. And emergencies are bound to happen. So that's the next thing. The other thing is really focusing in on getting out of debt. You know, um, there everybody struggles with this. There are many ways to do it, or really two major ways to do it. But getting out of revolving credit card consumer debt is important. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have any. I do think that you need to have credit but you do need to use it responsibly. But if you're not able to pay all your balances off at the end of the month and you're carrying them, which means you they're charging you interest every month for this, then your objective really should be is how can I create a debt elimination plan so that by XYZ date, I have to get out of debt. Now, when you do that, if it's that important to you, when we look at your budget or your spending plan, we may adjust some things and you may have to adjust some things to be able to achieve, achieve that objective. But no matter what, getting out of debt should be a very important part, especially when you, if you have to start over financially. I had to do it. I think it is so very important that you take the time and strategize to get out of debt. Because there's nothing worse than continuing to pay for borrowed money. The, you, it just never, you never seem to get ahead. So having that kind of plan is also important. The next thing I always uh, recommend is educate yourself, right? So if you're listening to that po this podcast, then you're doing just that, right? But there's so many things out there. It can become confusing. It can be a lot of noise. Find something that resonates with you, that gives you the, the feeling and the peace. And, and, you know, we women, we're, we're very intuitive, but find something that resonates with you. Get the education and the encouragement and the empowerment that you need. The books, the podcasts, the workshops, webinars, whatever you could get a hand, a hang on, a hand on so that you can learn to help you maybe improve your situation or, you know, connect with other people who are trying to do the same thing and creating a group of people that, you know, have the same objectives. You know, one of the worst things I think we women find ourselves doing is, you know, we hang out with friends and, uh, you know, we're on a path. Like, look, I want to get out of debt. Or my objective is to save three months of my expenses. And I'm only focused on that. But then you're hanging out with people that want to brunch every week and want to do those things that may take away from the objective. Now, if it doesn't take away from the objectives, by all means, do your thing. But if you think about, hey, you know what? I can be redirecting those resources to something else for temporarily so that I can achieve my goal. Then you need to find a, a tribe, a group of people that kind of have that mindset. Because what's going to happen is you're always going to have this FOMO. You're going to be pulling and pushing against 
really what you want. You're going to be questioning, well, do I really want this? Because, you know, I need to live in the now and I need to, you know, I only live once and all those things are right. And, and I agree, but if you have a goal, you really need to surround yourself with people who have the same objectives. So going to things, getting the education, going to workshops, listening to podcasts, reading books, uh, whether it's an actual book or an audible so that you can get the knowledge that you need. And I promise you, it will not only just be knowledge, but you'll get the fi financial self-confidence that you need. You'll understand how to do things better. I know that was huge for me. And I am a big learner. I'm all I, I, on Fridays. I call it my ABL days. Always be learning. And so, part of my Friday, I'm always trying to learn something new to better myself and to be able to implement in my practice to serve my clients. But nevertheless, educating yourself is also extremely important. And then, lastly, is get help. Listen. I realized I couldn't do it myself. And I'll be honest, I am a, um, I'm a single mom. I'm an only child. Um, I'm kind of the first in my family to do a lot, you know, so the first, you know, bachelor's and master's and doctorate and all that stuff. Uh, I think the first business owner um, in my generation. And I'm used to kind of doing things solo. And, and I, I do fine with that. But I'll, I'll be honest, I couldn't do it alone. I can only do it but so much alone. So once I hit the ceiling and the threshold and I needed more, I needed more support, I needed more help, I had to find people that would help me, people that wouldn't judge me, people who were honest with me, who weren't going to play games with me to give me this old crap about, oh, yes, girl, you deserve it. You deserve it when... I'm sinking when I really deserve to live the life that I want to live, but every decision I'm making is pulling me back. And so I had to get help and I had to get someone who would be honest with me, shake my tree, uh, speak the truth to me. And I'm a New Yorker. So, you know, I actually needed a little crass. So, uh, you know, my, my advisor, he is really straightforward. He gets all in my case and he lets me know, you know, where my mindset is off, what I'm doing that doesn't make sense and recommends things that I should be doing. And so that, that, that resonates with me. You have to find someone that resonates with you, but getting the help of a professional who will not judge you who will not, who understands where you are. They may have been there themselves. They're not there anymore. And they are lifting as they climb. So I am a big proponent of that and getting the help that you need so that you can get where you want to be. You know, a lot of women who are very successful have great jobs, but they're working 60 and 70 hours a week. The income, they've reached their ceiling. They may want to make some changes. They may want to pivot. They may want to start their own business. How can we get ready for that? How can you get someone in your corner to get you ready to make those adjustments that you want to make in your life that, of course, will impact your finances? So getting the help that you need, getting the support that you need, getting the empowerment, getting the encouragement, I think that is so huge. And I'll tell you, I would not be here if I did not have folks like that in my corner. And I strongly, strongly encourage you to make sure that you have folks like that in your corner. So I gave you some tips. Um, this episode is, I uh, hope resonates with you. I hope that you could uh, understand my why and be able to start working on how you can begin to get where you want to be financially. And, you know, if you need help, if you want help, if you're willing to invest in yourself, because this is definitely not something that you can just, you know, willy nilly about. It does require you to invest some time and some resources into it to get what you want. Then I strongly encourage you to get help. And I'd be willing to be the person that helps you if you feel comfortable 
You know, I always say that synergy is the most important thing when it comes to working with finances. This is probably the most vulnerable conversation you have when you have to expose your finances. A lot of times women have shame when they come to see me. They feel like they should be a certain place and they're not. So there's a lot of regrets that they didn't invest. They didn't make the best financial decisions. And you need someone to work with you that helps you to move past that, that will help you to forgive yourself from that and begin to put a plan in place that makes sense for you so that you can move in the direction you want. So synergy is important uh, because I say to the women that I work with, listen, we're going to do a financial GYN checkup. And this process is just like that. And I also say to them, like, how many times do you change your GYN? I mean, I, I think I've had one my whole life with my kids unless I moved to another city, which I did. And then I had to find another one that was local to me. That's because it was a hands-on situation. But this requires you to be fully transparent, to be fully open and fully vulnerable. And the person that you work with has to handle that with care. And you have to feel comfortable and you two have to be have synergy to be able to help you achieve your objectives. So if you'd like to have a conversation like that with me, I welcome you to do that. And you can uh, visit my website, womantowomanfinancial.com. I'll put it in the show notes. You can also email me at info at womantowomanfinancial.com as well as call my office at 904-753-5250. And if you'd like to schedule a complimentary conversation, this conversation is on me and, and meaning, you know, there is no charge for the com first conversation. And we can talk about if there are synergy, you know, what are your goals and am I the right person to help you achieve them? And if I'm not, I will let you know I'm such a straight shooter. And if I am, I'd love to be able to help you. But if nothing ever comes of this, if we never meet, I would encourage you to take some of the tips that I've provided to you today and start implementing them in your life. And if you need my help, I'm here. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for listening.